Harvard, where I began my scientific career. He was one of the founders of nuclear power. He was actually the father of the hydrogen bomb. My mentor was Edward Teller. So I got to know Edward Teller quite well. And Edward Teller loved nuclear energy. He thought we would all have reactors everywhere. But he knew how dangerous they were. And so I'll never forget what he told me. He said, nuclear power does not belong on the surface of the earth. It belongs underground. It is so dangerous, it is so volatile, that if it's underground and you have a meltdown, what do you do? You put a manhole cover on it. If in Japan we had nuclear power plants that were underground, then today all they would have to do after a tsunami is put the manhole cover on. Instead, we may have to evacuate northern Japan. You probably heard the latest, and that is workers may have to be evacuated pretty soon. Now, when the workers are evacuated, the reactor's in free fall, free fall, and we'll have meltdowns in four reactors simultaneously. So I'll discuss this tonight on Nightline. But anyway, let's take a few questions. Yeah? How is the technology so close to our bodies is going to affect our health? And also, what are we going to do with all the waste created by the technology? Okay, so the question is, what will this technology do to our bodies, and what about the waste produced by this technology? This is called human tissue engineering. Already we are gradually being able to reproduce from your own cells most of the organs of your body. Now we're doing the complex ones. The next will be the liver. And we hope to even do the brain at some point. We won't be able to replace the brain, but we will be able to inject stem cells into the brain, have them incorporate themselves into the living brain, and we'll be able to reverse Parkinson's maybe, or maybe even Alzheimer's. Also, we'll be able to extend the lifespan. The aging process is now being unraveled. This is huge. We've identified 60 genes that control the aging process. We now more or less know why you die. The question is, can we stop the clock? The answer is no. But we now know what aging is. Aging is entropy. Aging is disorder, chaos. Every time the cell divides, it picks up a little bit of disorder, mutation. Junk. That's why we age. But the cell has repair mechanisms. For example, a car. Where does aging take place in a car? Well, the engine, right? The engine has carbon deposits. It has oxidation, wear and tear. What is the engine of a cell? The mitochondria, the power plant of a cell. We now know where aging takes place. And if we can reinforce uh, repair mechanisms, we could then stop the clock. This is one of three methods now being looked at by scientists who now believe for the first time in, in human history that we can now see a possibility of perhaps living maybe almost forever. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Two more. Um, I really like the idea of having a better chips monitor your health. Uh, and thereby lifestyle. However, am I right to assume that safeguarding such information is the next top career field? Yes. Uh, with, this in with all this information going up on the internet, we're going to have to find ways to stop this information from going in the hands of petty thieves. You know, before I wrote, I wrote this book, I read Brave New World. Brave New World is what everyone feared. Big Brother. The internet might have become Big Brother. Might have. But in 1989, something that happened that changed everything in 1989. First, the Soviet bloc broke up. Second, the National Science Foundation saw that the Internet was no longer necessary as a military weapon. So what did the National Science Foundation do in 1989 that changed world history? It gave it away for free. A technology that could have become like 1984 was given away for free by the National Science Foundation. Today, it's everywhere. If President Obama tries to stop the internet, the reaction would be laughter. So, if the internet is so powerful, what's the problem? The problem is not Big Brother. The problem is Little Brother. Nosy busybodies, petty thieves, criminals. Little Brother is the problem. So why don't we create software programs to protect us 
against Nigerian scam artists. <laughs> because there's no money in it yet. If you're a software writer and you make software, who do you want to work for? Apple, because that's where the big bucks are. The big bucks are in software that makes things that kids want. Kids want the latest in everything. Kids are not necessarily interested in stopping Nigerian scams. However, eventually, there'll be so many scams on the internet, the software designers will start to make real solid safeguards to protect us. Okay? So give it a few years until it becomes profitable for software designers to make these things, and then we'll be protected from Little Brother. Okay, one more question. Dr. Good evening. <coughs> With all the advances that we have seen on the Discovery Channel that you often speak and write about with the creation of uh, human uh, tissue and advancement like that, is anything occurring, Doctor, now or in the very near future with regard to in utero detection and reversal of things such as CP, such as autism, with this great uh, ability that we have to detect disease and to assist with assistive technology with older people. What is happening in utero, doctor, to detect things like autism? Thank you. Well, the problem is not really detection. The problem is we don't know what these diseases are. It's even more fundamental. We're very good at detecting things because physicists are the ones who sequence the DNA. It was Francis Crick, a physicist. It was a physicist who worked out how to read the DNA in mass. That was Walter Gilbert, another physicist. So identifying <laughs> genes, identifying illnesses, that's very easy. The problem is we don't know what they are. We still don't know what autism is. We have no coherent theory of autism. We know that it's partly genetic, partly environmental, but what is it? It's probably a collection of diseases that we have not yet identified. Once the biologists identify what it is, then we physicists will figure out easy ways to diagnose it. So we're still in the wilderness. Right now, we can, like, for example, schizophrenia. We still don't know what schizophrenia, uh, where it comes from. It's partly genetic, but you can have twins. Twins. One twin has schizophrenia, and the other one doesn't. So schizophrenia cannot be purely genetic. So that's a frontier question. It's a question that we cannot yet answer today. These are multi-genic diseases. Diseases involving more than one gene. If it involves one gene, like cystic fibrosis, like sickle cell anemia, like Tay-Sachs, we can nail it very quickly. But if it's multigenic, we're not there yet. Okay, anyway, so I'm going to have to end it here. So I'll be signing your thank book. You. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Please stay seated. We're going to call people up. He's going to stick around and sign everything.